All right, everyone, this is Pamela Schwartz, and we are just finishing up our study of um, Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, and we're finishing up with a workbook that was written by Stephen Monahan. And it's the 66 day workbook. Of course, remember that 66 days is the average of what it takes to create a habit, a good habit. Yes, yeah, you got it, Ms. Ellen. Okay, so we're gonna go through the entire book relatively quickly because there's some great inspirational writings that are here and some very poignant questions. And we're not going to go into too much detail unless things come up for you that you have questions, comments, concerns, whatever, about how to go forward because this is really what's going to help you as we get to the point of being able to use this as your 66-day journal, okay? Uh, and, and being able to use a domino on a daily basis. And remember for 65 and a wake up, it is those uh, two coffee shop interviews and one three way that are the dominoes to do every day. And that's what's gonna help to uh, propel your business into greater success. So starting at the beginning, we're going to see that. Okay, three feet from gold. Oh wait, never mind. I wanna get back to the very beginning. Og Mandino, one of my favorite authors, his quote is, it is those who concentrate on one thing at a time who advance in this world. Um, Og Mandino wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. Where is my book? It's around here somewhere. Um, it is something that I use almost on a daily basis, and I'm fibbing because it's not right within my grasp. Oh, here it is. Do, do, do. It is here. Og Mandino, he's written many, but this is a fabulous book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. And when I went through my 66 days, I was adding in the quotes that we would do because you would cover a scroll for an entire month and you read it three times a day, one chapter, which is called a scroll. And I would pull out quotes from this book and use it as inspiration for myself and for others when I was going through my 65 days and a wake up. So again, he's quoted in the beginning, it is those who concentrate on one thing at a time who advance in this world. And so three feet from gold, and the point of this chapter is never give up. Um, in Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill tells of a man named R. Darby who had one thing that he wanted, to be rich. And he went out west to the Colorado Gold Rush. And so he struck it rich at first, but then, hello, Melissa. But then once he got out there, the gold petered out. He lost interest, hang on, gave up and sold his gold mining equipment for pennies on the dollar to a junk dealer. And he hopped a train back home. The junk dealer hired an expert geologist, right? So he knew what he wanted and he knew the resources to get it. He drilled where the expert advised and struck the mother load of gold just three feet from where Darby and his uncle stopped digging. So R. Darby was later interviewed and shared his story of quitting too soon. And he attributed his later vast success in the insurance business to the life lesson he learned from abandoning his dream too soon. Welcome, Doug. Glad to have you here. Uh, and he said he could accept it that sometimes things would become difficult and some, sometimes he would lose, but never again would he give up on his life goals. And that is the big point of this is never give up because we're all just three feet from gold. So uh, the, going into the workbook questions and notes, the first question is to you, what is the lesson of the three feet from gold? And then write in examples of when you have stopped too soon. We've all, if we've been in this industry for a while, we've all been in a position where we have just stopped short of success, right? We're just on the cutting edge. You, you're not there yet, but you think you're not going to get there. And so instead of, instead of plowing forward, you give in, right? The only failure that doesn't lead to success is the one that makes you stop. So failure is okay. It's all a part of the growing process. The point is never give up, never give in, keep going, keep going. That's what this part of the three feet from gold is about. 
Then it asks you to give examples of when you have persevered, even in the difficult times. And then how will you end your habit of stopping too soon? So these are some great questions to pose of yourself. I want you all to be able to, as we go through the book, you want to be able to stop and answer those questions of yourself. And they're going to be very personal and they're going to be very different because each of us have our own specific goals about what is most important, what is our one thing after all. And we may have several different things going on, but we were talking about that one thing to focus. Then the next section is about The Will to Win by Vince Lombardi. Winning isn't a sometime thing, it's an all the time thing. You don't win once in a while, you don't do things right once in a while, you do them right all the time. Winning is a habit, unfortunately so is losing. And how much have we seen that in ourselves and in people on our teams or people that we know that they get caught in this habit, that they're not doing the right behaviors, they haven't created the good positive uh, habits, and therefore end up doing the wrong things. There is no room for second place. There's only one place, first place. And he says, play from the ground up every inch. You've got to be smart to be number one in any business. But more importantly, you've got to play with your heart, with every fiber of your body, every fiber of your being, from your heart, your soul, put it all into it to be able to find that success. The object is to win. It is a reality of life that men are competitive and the most competitive games draw the most competitive men. That's why they are there. I've never known a man worth his salt who in the long run, deep down in his heart, didn't appreciate the grind, the discipline, because he knows, he understands what it will take to get that coveted prize. And Vince Lombardi finalizes this story with, I believe in God and I believe in human decency, but I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all that he holds dear is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle victorious. Nothing feels greater than to have achieved an accomplishment. And we talk about here, there's no such thing as second. Well, guess what? There is second. It's okay. And, and our team challenge that Ruth Ellen was a part of and um, Peggy Gleason and Hanny Sai and Colleen Richter and I all together were in a team, professional network marketers. And in our division, we came in second place, but we still won. We got, we got $200 worth of free product and that was really awesome, you know, and we, we qualified for a drawing and each got a hundred dollar visa gift cards that are on their way. So, you know what? Yeah, that's right. So when you think about it, you know, that was our, our goal was for all of us to be qualified for all of us to, to have a chance and an option to, to get in there. And it did help grow the business. It did help grow our confidence in ourselves and an ability to work together and achieve. Thank you, Marianne. That was great. So in the workbook questions and notes, what is the will to win? And when have you demonstrated the will to win? And when have you not demonstrated the will to win? So again, all personal questions to go forward and, and ask of yourself. So then he goes on to talk about, he being Stephen Monahan, goes on to talk, uh, talking about why he wrote the book. And he says, he's talking about after surviving a terminal illness, he threw himself face first into one new thing after another and was happy to come back from the dead that he wasn't going to miss a thing. He wanted to do all he could to enjoy each moment, each day. Enjoying each day and trying new things over the last 10 years. I decided to make life easier and focus just on just one thing for the balance of my life. I have been happier than ever before. To be here is the, in this amazing world is a gift. Each day is a new present and how you spend each day is how you will spend your life. So I love his perspective that he has because this guy came back from the precipice, from the edge, from the possibility of no longer existing and realizing the importance of not taking anything for granted, to be appreciative, to be engaging, to be alive every single day and do 
whatever is that one most important thing in your life to be able to go forward and, and feel like you have a sense of accomplishment and that you have made a difference in the world, right? So the next section is how do we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And in The Writing Life by Annie Dillard is a poignant meditation and deep observation on creating a focused life well lived. How we spend our days is how we spend our lives. Each and every day of our lives is important. No day is to be wasted or taken for granted. What is the most important one thing for you to spend your days doing? Will you say you lived the life you wanted? What will be the one thing that really defined you? What was the one thing that made it wonderful for you and for those you loved? Create and live that kind of life now. You're never too young or too old to change. And I have a little um, ceramic thing on my wall that said, it's never too late to be who you want to be. And I think my mother-in-law gave me that, but I, I just love that. And I keep that in my, in my sight so I can feel the encouragement from that. So do not stop three feet from gold. We all are just three feet, right? So just keep persevering. So for the workbook questions for this section, it's how do you want to spend your days? What is the most important one thing for you to spend each day doing? And how will achieving your one thing allow you to spend each day as you want to live your life? So what I enjoy about this is the fact that we have the ability to look into ourselves, to look into our circumstances and find what it is that's going to give us great pleasure and fulfill the desire of our hearts and what we need to do in order to get to that point. That's what's so beautiful about taking all of the knowledge we've learned from the One Thing book and implementing them in the workbook. The next section is called The Shift. Could your one thing be replaced? And I thought this was a really interesting part of the book. The opposite of work is not leisure, it's boredom. We were not created to be idle or to just get by. We were created for greatness, to always grow, expand, and move forward. And now he goes on to talk about the different ages that we have in our culture. And it's the agricultural age, which of course was farmers, the industrial age of factory workers, and now the creative age for creators and empathizers. And he's talking about in the, um, in the agricultural age and in the, the industrial age, and now the new shift, the third shift is the creative age. But in the last 100 years of the industrial age, our work was dominated by left brain ways of thinking. And left brain thinking is highly analytical, structured, inside the box, hierarchical, controlled, and measured. Very unyielding, just very specific, cookie cutter, right? Think about it. Think about it as in a factory, to the ka-chung, ka-chung, ka-chung of something being repeatedly made by, the, by a process exactly the same all the time. And that's that methodical thinking of the, of the left brain, right? And so now we're beginning to shift to be right brain thinkers, right? Be more creative, right? And this is going to be a big change. And so for the past 100 years, when someone wanted a job, they would apply for one, they would get the job, and then they would keep that job for a long time. But those days are long gone, right? Today you're in charge of your own career. You have to figure out your one thing and be the creator of it. Choose a one thing that is viable, not only for the short-term present, but for the fast-changing future as well. And then the economy is built on cooperative, conceptual, and creative right brain thinking. In this conceptual age, there's, there's a book that was written called A Whole New Mind by Daniel Pink that he recommends. And then going into the next section, and this is about understanding about what will happen to us if we become replaceable, right? Work is going to those who can do it cheaper, faster, or better. Cheaper, faster, and better advances come from shifting work out of country, or it comes from doing it better from disruptive technologies, or 
from artificial intelligence, robotics, battery-powered cars, driverless cars, and algorithm, algorithms. With the new world of work, jobs, careers, and entire industries will go away. Reinvent yourself and create a new one thing. And that is why your one thing should be at the highest level, not at the task level, right? So then he goes on to talk about what he does as a life coach, and he has daily tasks in that capacity where he writes articles, publishes books, does public speaking, he networks, he does job transition coaching, midlife crisis, business and entrepreneur coaching. And each one of those is a task. Each one of those is a subset of his one thing. And his one thing is not any one of them individually, however. His one thing is teaching. That's his highest purpose. And teaching how to live an enlightened, intentional life is his one thing, right? So think about it. Think about your one thing has to be something that can't be replaced by some other technology. And I feel that the relationship building that we do when we follow the protocol of the 65 days in a wake up with the two coffee shop interviews and the one three-way, building the relationship with people is something that can never be replaced by technology, okay? So even though someone can have all of these parameters and understand about who is reading what and who has clicked on what link and who's done this or that, the truth is it's the relationship that can never be replaced. That's the missing element in our industry because everybody else is doing it in a different way than we are. And this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where people feel like they found a home because that's what I am finding when I'm talking to people out there in the world. They're looking for a home. They want to be able to have somebody they can trust in a relationship. And that's very, very unique to what we have here. Do any of you have any questions or comments at this point? No, you're good. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. I was going to say something. Yes. Because I think um, you're completely right. This analytical and all that type of thinking, you know, the creativity is really what we're all here to do is to be creative and, and to uh, create is to empower. So um, yeah, it's really interesting because I think there's certain things when I read or you know, books or whatever that get my mind thinking creatively, creatively, and other things that I read that I feel like even though it's good information, it's stagnating. Yes. You guys have that? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, as a matter of fact, on the one star call today, Alex talked about that. He said he talked about a book that had some great points, but he's like, honestly, I didn't finish the book because it was very boring and dull for him, but there was great material in it and poignant parts, but it was the fact that it was laborious in a different level. You know, yeah. I, I haven't felt that with these books. I've been feeling like we're getting so much, like we're, it's jumping oh, yeah. out of the page at us, you know, the lit, the, the liveness of it, the life of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, good. Thank you. What I was going to say, Pamela, is I used to live in Horicon where John Deere, mm -hmm. the big John Deere plant is, the home of John Deere. And we lived across the street from John Deere. And when we drive down this, the, the other street where they had the manufacturing plant, you could see at night all of the machinery working and the lights were all off except emergency lighting and a guard would walk around just to make sure the machines were all doing what they were supposed to do so they were cutting out sheets of metal stamping it forming it and everything and nobody was there overseeing it it was all done by machines that's crazy isn't it yeah we sometimes pull over our car and just sit there and watch it all happening because it was just fascinating to watch it it's fascinating, but it's kind of creepy in the same token, <laughs> the thought yes. that, right? And, and then I think, about, I think about the people that used to have that job, and I think about where are they now, what are they doing, you know, because they've been replaced 
And um, that's, it is, it's fascinating. Um, and I just, I pray that our personalities are never something that we're going to have to worry about being replaced. I know artificial intelligence is interesting, but um, I just don't think, at least in our lifetimes, that we're going to see something that is going to be quite as exciting as having a conversation with somebody with the, with the multiplicity and the magnitude of the mind that people have the ability to, to go back and forth and, and, and be able to talk about and discuss and feel. Um, I just can't imagine that to be something we can be replaced with. Um, Marianne said, that's how Amazon is. Three football fields of machines running the show. Fascinating. Yeah. You know what though? It's really interesting that you brought that up because my son and daughter-in-law just uh, purchased some lighting fixtures, fixtures for their kitchen. And it just goes to show that if a person were there and reading it and looking at it, I think the likelihood would have been less that they would have gotten it wrong. But they had in one box the wrong color, which happened to be the right color of the lighting fixture that they wanted, but in the wrong box. And then the other box was the wrong box and the wrong color. And we thought, what are the chances of the machines messing up so badly to get so that everything, they, they got lucky with the one. And he, I was, he actually was here at the house when he called them. He's like, we got lucky that we got the one that was the right color <laughs> in the wrong label box. But what's up with you people? <laughs> what's going on? So it probably was automated. So, well, thank you for sharing that, both of you. Okay. So, all right, let's see. So when you choose your one thing, select something that is not task oriented, process oriented, or something that is just a subsection of something bigger. Tasks can be replaced with new technologies, big things, creative things cannot. So think big picture. Pieces may change, but a big one thing will always be relevant. So what will become more valued then will be things that require creative thinking and things like emotion, empathy, creativity, and heart. That's that relationship stuff we're talking about. These are traits that cannot be replaced by a Watson IBM computer. The seat of intelligence will one day soon shift from the head to the heart. And I am thankful that we are in a great position for that. We're prepared and ready. So the workbook questions and notes for this section are determine if your one thing will be a viable part of the new creative age or become instead obsolete. Do you consider yourself a logical, linear, left brain thinker or a cooperative, conceptual, and creative right brain thinker? And that's an interesting thought because you may find that you have a little of both. I know for me, I do. I know that there is a very much an analytical part of my thought process, my you know scientific researcher background, but I also know I'm left-handed. And so that means my right brain is more in control and I am more creative and I love to be creative and put things together. So I, I think that we have to, we, have, we think about it that way and look how we can employ them together to make them work hand in hand um, is probably the best thing that we can do because we don't want everybody to just be creative thinkers. We need to have that ability to actually do the tasks at hand, right? So we don't want to go from one side, you know, absolute to the other side. We need to have a little bit of a mixture. So then he goes on to ask, can businesses overseas do your job cheaper? No, I say no, they can't. So how can a computer application or computer program do your job cheaper or faster? What is the creative, what in the creative age may be able to do your job faster and more accurately? Does your job require creative or inventive thinking or tasks that can be replaced? Can a robot or robotics do it better, faster, or cheaper? And what disruptive progress may eliminate your industry? Right. So even the Amazons of the world can't replace us with the personality. Linda, Linda says she is ambidextrous, so I am both creative and analytical. I agree. I am the same way. 
is your one thing a short-term or long-term sustain, sustainable one thing? And how have you prepared to change your one thing when your industry is impacted by the creative shift? And so our industry of network marketing, our industry of nutritional supplementation, that can be impacted, right? So we need to pay attention to it. And I see the things that are happening with our company in that the presentations that are being made, the personal stories that are coming out, like when Sanjeev is, is working with Dr. Lundell and you hear this very specific, analytically trained um, doctor who's now speaking from the heart because of an aggravation of what he witnessed over the years. And now he's creatively pursuing a way to help people be healthier and happier. Whereas before he was fixing their hearts, but they would keep coming back. And so there was obviously something else going on. And that's the beautiful creative shift that I see within our industry. So we are in a great position for that. So then the next section is called digging deep. And he said, it's really important to dig deep. And that's how we can develop success faster when we're willing to look inside, willing to deal with the discomfort of touching old wounds and then fixing them, we can move forward, right? That's a really hard thing to look at ourselves objectively and be able to say, okay, this is what I was doing in the past that didn't work and be able to be willing to be malleable and be able to change so that you can be more successful doing it a different way, right? So you're, uh, figure out if your one thing is someone you want to be or something that instead you want to do. And this can be seen as your miss mission or your purpose in life. Something big you want to do in life or view it as the person you want to be in life. The thing that gets you up in the morning, excites you, and makes you content at the end of the day. So that when you lay your head down, weary from a hard day's work, and you can feel like you've done a great job because you've served others, that's really what this is all about. That's where you should be focusing your attention. It puts the wind in your sails and the bounce in your walk. My bounce. I'm sitting on my yoga ball. So your one thing is not just another one of the many things you wish you could have or accomplish or do. It's a big thing, an inspiring thing, a thing that stretches you each day, a specific desire that has been arrived at only after much serious thought. And it will be a lifelong pursuit that will transcend all change. Having one thing will bring focus and direction to your busy life. Live with less stress. You'll not run around wasting precious time and energy trying to accomplish too many things at once, nor will you bounce from one thing to the next, quickly abandoning anything that doesn't bring immediate satisfaction. You're in a position to concentrate each day's efforts on a definite domino to knock them down for that day, and you move closer to being or living the life you want to live, being the person you want to be. So set specific times for regular personal introspection and reflection to assess whether you are on the right track to achieving your one thing. Evaluate your progress monthly, quarterly, and even semi-annually. And evaluating your progress towards your stated desire, you must be completely honest with yourself. Decide if you need to change your strategies or tactics to achieve your one thing. And then make revisions uh, in, the, in the tasks you're doing, but your one thing should never be changed for minor fallbacks or obstacles because they're going to happen. That's a guarantee, right? The changing your one thing should only be made because of exceptional unplanned circumstances that are beyond your control or because you have seriously evaluated your purpose or aim and have concluded that it is wrong for you and you have decided to commit to a different one thing. So in the workbook questions and notes for this portion, 
list three things in your life today not going the way you want them to go. And then list three things you can do to change that. Right? We have to, we have to recognize it. So recognizing that there's an issue is the greatest step. And what are the five most important one things you would like to be doing? How would your life look if you picked one of them and achieved it? What would you feel like every day if you were living your one thing? What will you give in return for what your one thing? What will you give in return for your one thing? Will it be your time, your money, your privacy, or your independence? Remember, this is the most valuable thing in your life. There are going to be things you need to give up. Remember we talked about, remember it's going to get messy, the stuff around you, you're going to have to deal with it because when you focus on your one thing, other things are going to get left behind. And those of us who are you know, busy women, especially, and you know, busy men, we have things going on in our lives that they're going to have to fall by the wayside in a way, shape, or form. Maybe not permanently, but for the time being while you focus on the one thing. So what do you want this as your, why do you want this as your one thing? Why? That's a big, big question. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. What is your plan for achieving your one thing? List three strategies you will devise to achieve your plan. And when you look back, when you look back on your life, what will you be most proud and pleased accomplishing? So this has got to be something that makes you look back on your life and go, oh, wow, look what I did. You know, if you're not feeling that way, if you're not able to look at your progress and look back at what you're doing and have that, maybe it is time to reevaluate, right? You need to think about that. If you're not going in a position where you can look back and see the, the, the trail, the little residue that you're leaving of the good that you're doing, then maybe it's time to look at it again and readdress it and modify it to be something that you can be proud of, that you can, you can feel like you're leaving a legacy, that you are leaving a trail of happy hearts, right? So here he asks us to take a mental and emotional break. And then he says, do you enjoy reflecting on these deeper questions or do they make you uncomfortable and take you out of your comfort zone? Well, for you to achieve something big, you have to grow. And to grow, you have to face your fears head on. Stare them down and step right through them. When you step through your fears, you will see they were not solid, but just clouds of energy that you created, right? Fear, false expectations appearing real. Every time you step through one of your fears, you grow and they just poof, dissipate. You walk right through them, poof, they didn't even matter. Have you been to that point where you've been afraid to pick up the phone, to dial, to call one person or any person, and then you actually do it and you, you say, what was I so afraid of? That was like such a big deal, why? I can. <laughs> what was the big deal about that? Why did I frighten myself to such a point that I couldn't breathe, I couldn't sleep? And then when you're able to just blow it all away and be done, right? I took okay. a webinar earlier this week and he said that uh, our bodies are designed or our minds are designed to protect us in, from everything. So that's what that, that talk is in our mind. Oh, if you do this, this might happen. Oh, if you do this, this might happen. And he said one of the ways to get around that or to deal with that is to say, thank you for that. I am choosing to go forward. <laughs> you know, thank you for the information, <laughs> you know, and just move forward. That is cool. I love that. I love that. So that's giving... Um, honor to that part of ourselves that is so important, yet we're, we're calming it and saying it's going to be okay. 
it's going to be okay. I appreciate the concern, but I'll be fine. And I've had to do that with people where people have been concerned about one thing or another. And I'll say, thank you. It's, I appreciate that. It's okay. I'm going to be okay. You know? Um, so I think that that was beautiful, Linda. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So he says back to the workbook. So he goes on to say, or ask, whom do you want to serve and why? Do you owe it to somebody or something to accomplish something special? What talent, passion, or knowledge do you have to offer the world? And the other day, my husband, Andy, and I were taking a walk, and we were talking about this. We were talking about people's gifts. And there's a reason why God gives us these gifts, so that we can serve others. And everybody is, oh, beam. Everybody is a little bit different. Come here, baby. Come here. Come up. Hold on. He's getting lonely. Hold on one second, guys. Oh, sorry. My grand dog was getting lonely. Oh, good boy. So everybody's a little bit different and everybody has special gifts and talents. And we can serve each other beautifully in the world if we can tap into them. And it's always so heartbreaking to, to know somebody who doesn't think they have anything to offer the world. And that's often because it's a person who has been, um, their, their, their dreams have been squashed by others in their lives, right? They've, they've had a, a, an experience or a situation that causes them to forget, to not recognize the beauty that is in themselves to be able to persevere and, and do something special that they were wonderfully made and that they have a way that nobody else does of dealing with the world. And so I think that it's always important for us as we go through this life to love people and to help them to, that's part of my gift, I think, to help them to be able to see what that is and, and bring that out. It's kind of like, shining up an old penny, you know, because the, it, they all have that, that beautiful uh, shine when they are created and they may get tarnished over the course of time, but, you know, you can polish them up and make them just brandy new like they were. All right, Mr. Bean, you're going to have to go back down. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so he goes on to ask, where will your life lead if you continue on the same path and then what weekly monthly or yearly mile marker should you establish to achieve your one thing this is really i think important where if you have a whiteboard or a dream board that it's important for you to be able to see something and look at something and visualize it as a future event and creating reasonable milestones you know you need to have that time set because you can say that I want to have this by a certain date, but you can't have that by a certain date until you do the things that need to get done on the way, right? So you need to set the dream, but create the reasonable goals on the path to that, um, achieving that dream. So what one thing can you do that will earn you the greatest reward? What one thing can you shoot for that will benefit the most people? Why will your one thing make you feel you have done something valuable with your life? And then the next section is why. Why do you want your one thing? And he said very few people or companies can clearly articulate why they do what they do. When I say why, I don't mean to make money. That's a result. But why, I mean, what is your purpose, cause, or belief? And this was a quote by Simon Sinek. And as a matter of fact, hang on a second. Bring this out. Have you ever wondered why highly successful people or companies have been able to achieve extraordinary results or success while others with the same resources have failed? Simon Sinek in his book, Start With Why, asked that question. This is one of the books that we will do in our book study after Marianne and I have completed the Longevity University training. And Marianne said that she's already read this book at least once. 
and she loves Simon Sinek, has followed his work since, I think, 2007, uh, when she saw him in a TED Talk. And so I thought what's really cool is my husband bought this book for me before I even had gotten into this, before I had even done this. And I said, there's no such thing as coincidence. Bean, it's okay. So I, I know that my husband has this incredible gift and it's really funny because he doesn't recognize his own gift, but he has this really great intuitiveness. And I think that's probably um, why he's been in law enforcement for his entire life. You know, he just has this way. He can feel it. He doesn't know how to, <laughs> to articulate it. It just exists. And so he'll, he'll bring out beautiful examples of it, like buying me a book like this without even knowing, you know, and I think that's pretty cool. So um, he said they succeeded because they all started with the why factor. And this is in reference to Martin Luther King Jr., Steve Jobs, and the Wright brothers. Asking why you want your one thing must be answered. It is extremely important. Your why must be determined in parallel with your what. Why is important? Why is important is because it will be the driver behind what you want to achieve as your one thing. So when he's talking about as a as an example, a nonprofit organization that he created. All nonprofits must have a mission statement, which is a what, and a vision statement, which is a why. And he goes on to liken why to fuel. The why is the fuel. A rocket goes nowhere without the fuel, right? No fuel, no one thing. When you determine the one thing you want and know why you want it, you can then go after it. Keep both what you want and why you want in mind as you go forward. So in the workbook questions and notes, your why, why did you choose this one thing out of all the things you could do with your life? Why do you get out of bed every morning? Why must you achieve your one thing? And who will your one thing benefit besides you? Because remember, we're in this creative, cooperative part of our era at this point, this age, and we need to make sure that we are helping other people in this process because that's how we're going to work together to elevate each other. So the next section, creating a habit, making, a, making one thing a habit. F.M. Alexander wrote, people do not decide their future, they decide their habits and their habits decide their future. You will achieve your one thing by building a new habit, which is this 66-day journal. And in this chapter, he's going to talk about how to build a habit. You will only succeed in obtaining, then sustaining your one thing with the creation of a habit. While willpower can be used to influence our minds, actions, habits have just as much influence as well. So for you to achieve your one thing, you're going to have to create a habit of doing it daily for the next 66 days. And by doing this, you will be creating a new habit. And by creating a new habit, you'll be displacing the old habit that has been holding you back. You cannot, through willpower alone, break bad habits. You can only create new good habits in the place of old bad habits. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act of willpower, but a habit. And then for the acquisition of a new habit or the leaving off of an old one, we must take care to launch ourselves with as strong and decided an initiative as possible. You cannot rest or break the chain until your new habit is securely rooted in your daily life. This is why in 65 days in a wake up, there cannot be any breach in the activity. It has to be continuous because if you break the habit, you are not going to create, find the success that you're looking for because you broke the chain. So you have to go back to day one. And we've seen it. We've done it ourselves. We've seen it in other people going back to day one and creating that habit as fresh and new. But the beautiful thing is, and I've seen it in so many people coming through our program, that day one is different 
it's really not day one. It is day one in the number, but the activity is the same, but the result is changed because they are better for it. They have now grown in the process. No matter if they had to stop and go back to the beginning, they are making an effort and they have learned so much. Repetition and continuity. If you do not feed and exercise your habit daily, it will wither and die. Um, 66 days is what it takes to create a habit. It is not in the start but in the moment of the habit producing a modest success that communicates the success to our brain as a win, and once the brain registers a win, it will start making the habit unconscious and automatic. That's where we talked about it at that day 20 or day 30 or on, where all of a sudden we said, I can't even stop myself. From this, I am talking to people without even, I'm doing interviews with people I didn't even intend on interviewing. So that's what happens is it becomes unconscious and automatic. When the habit becomes unconscious, the effort is lessened and you are on your way to a new way of acting, thinking, and doing. When your one thing becomes a habit, you will do it each day with little to no effort. And then in the next se section, he goes on to talk about why journaling is important. What happens to us is not as important as the meaning we assign to it. So think of that. What happens to us is not as important as the meaning we assign to it. We are in control, right? Journaling helps sort this out. Michael Hyatt wrote that. If you're serious, keep a journal. Don't trust your memory. And so... I have one that was a gift from Juanita Lamuth. We call each other sisters. So she's from California and it's written in the stars. And this, which was no, again, no such thing as coincidence is part of the team program that I have for my business team. And you look at that and then my team is called constellation, right? And so it all kind of flows and comes together. And so I keep in this journal, my little thoughts, hopes, and dreams. Thank you. Of, of what the what the future will hold and now I can see them coming together because I'm building this for the team and building it for a team that I have and a team that is yet to come you know build it and they will come kind of a thing and so that's a very important thing to do is is to prepare to get ourselves prepared for that point um, in the Bible it talks about the woman preparing herself as a queen right for the king to arrive and and as the bride, the bride is doing all these terrific things in preparation for the king to show up. And so that's what we need to do is we need to, we need to take care of all these things, make it absolutely amazing and wonderful so that when our success shows up, we're ready for it, right? So you can't be ready for it until you do the preparations. So having read the One Thing book, the focus question that you must answer to achieve your one thing is what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. The power of doing one thing each day to move you forward daily until you desire your desired one thing. Um, and then he knew that he would have to create a written and actionable plan that would keep him focused on his one thing every day until his one thing was achieved. And when we do this, we rid ourselves of a self-defeating habit that we subconsciously create, and then we build a new habit in its place. So you have a journal to write your ideas and thoughts for every day. It's a keystone tool to keep you growing, balanced, and focused. It is straightforward. Create a comfortable pattern to start out each day. Bring intentionality and clarity of thought. Remember, clarity is a key word for this year. We're, we're talking about making things simpler, making it clearer, more clarity to each day. Each day for the next 66 days, you will write in the journal the one domino you want to work on and knock over that day. Each day you choose a new domino for that day. You will write it down. You will then write down how you will accomplish it that day. You will accomplish that one domino for the day. And you will, of course, do many things by using this 66-day journal. You can be assured of, of that each day you will 
at least know the most important thing to do that particular day to move you toward the one thing you want to do or becoming the one thing you want to be. Each day is precious. You must not waste a day. And by writing out your intent each morning for the day and for the next 66 days, you will be advancing successfully toward achieving your one thing. And then he has the journal pages. And of course, on each page, he has today's date and today's domino. So if we're following our 65 days in a wake up, that domino, of course, would be the two coffee shop interviews and the one three way. And that would remain the same throughout the course of the 66 days. So he's talking about each day having a domino that's helping you to get closer to your one thing, to your goal, the things you want to have and what your purpose will be, right? And then he finishes out the book with a beautiful quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. No, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end that triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. How beautiful. A life well lived. Don't be afraid. Get out there. It's a wonderful world of people that need our help. Love on them, you know, really. And that's the end. I got this book. Yeah. Written by Renee Brown. I don't know if you guys have read her. Anyway, but her second book, which I haven't read yet, I've got to get it, but it's called Daring Greatly. And she talks about this quote from Theodore Roosevelt. And she talks, in this one, she talks about being face down in the arena, right? And those people who are standing back and they're criticizing, pointing fingers, or, you know, those people that are like, oh, you're in network marketing, but you're not successful yet or whatever. Well, they haven't been face down in the arena right? They haven't been doing the things that we've been doing. They haven't been working hard. And so while we're, doesn't look like much is happening, all kinds of things are happening, but in their life, they're still, it's still the same thing. They, ha they haven't moved forward in any way. They haven't progressed. They haven't grown. And, um, and so I often, especially like going back and visiting Nebraska, which is where my husband's from, but uh, we go back there and like those people are in the, they're in the same place. They were 35 years ago when we left. Just the same thing. Like they haven't grown any, I mean, it's just, it almost feels like you're going back in time. You know what? It's really funny that you said that because this year is the 35th anniversary of my high school graduation and they're uh, because I'm still friends with people on Facebook. And when I say friends on Facebook, there are a few people that I stay close in contact with. And there are others that we communicate with each other, but I wouldn't say that we're close. But I'm watching this because it's up in New Jersey and I'm not going to be going to this event because I, I, could, I could write the book. I could write the screenplay. I could know exactly what they're going to be doing. It might as well be, you know, the prom in 1983, honestly, you know, I, I'm rehearing a lot of things. Now there are other people that are very different and a lot of them have had terrific accomplishments in their lives and, and neat things. And some of them are going back to the reunion. So it, to each his own, it's, it's their point. But I think it's very interesting to see, you know, where I grew up, it's one square mile. My town is one square mile and our, you know, the, the people go from, I think it's what, five, no, it's probably 10,000 people. And then in the summer, it's like 25,000 people in one square mile. So it's, it's a, because people are coming there to go to the beach. And so it, it, things just haven't changed. They're just still very, very much the same. And I think that 
nobody there is offended by that. They love the fact that it hasn't changed. They don't want to leave that. And it's okay for them. And for me, it's a little bit different. And I can appreciate some of them. And some of them I can say, have a good time. <laughs> but I, I think that's so funny, especially since you said it's 35 years at the exact amount of time, Marianne. Um, <clears throat> ironically, I went back, you know, with Ken, I've been going, you know, I, Ken and I have been dating ever since, I don't know, I think he was like 19. I'm a, a couple of years older. So anyway, but, um, when we went back for his 10 year reunion and then now we go, you know, we were just back for his 40th reunion and people don't, they just think I graduated with them. You know, they've been seeing me so often, but I, um, I've actually signed up two people from his class reunion. So Dee Widener, yes. who was the doll, and I met her, and she still lives in Nebraska, but she has moved away, and uh, she's just amazing. And then Sherry, who we ended up, um, who just now is starting to do the business, um, actually lives out here in Colorado and uh, in Longmont. And so we didn't know that until, you know, the reunion was happening. but. Um, you know, those, it's like you said, those people are, they're fine. They're fine about who they are and where they're at. And that's okay. And I think that's what we learn in network marketing, that uh, people yes. are fine where they're at. And, and so last night, and, and I don't know if I trained, uh, if you guys have been on any of my trainings, but one of the things that I was training about was like the one to 10 factor, right? So where are you, you know? Um, how are you with your health? I mean, I don't, what you, you know, you just told me, you, you know, you have arthritis and, you know, you're having extreme uh, pain and you've got some digestive issues, but, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, how important is it for you to get your health under control? Right. And people, you know, like, they'll think about it and they're like, well, hmm, I don't know. I'm a five, right? Or I'm an eight, or I am a 10. I got to do something. I know I've got to do something. And so I think in for us, right, then we, by using that kind of one to 10 thing, then we can kind of know, all right, you know what, either I have to move this, these people along. I don't know if you guys did the moving the box training at the, at the last convention. Did you do that? It was great training. And, um, so the guy talks about having a bright idea being over here and everybody's over here and you're like, Oh, I've got Dr. Wallach and I've got these products and it's so exciting. And all these people are just looking at you like, you know, I don't, I don't know about nutrition. I don't know about Dr. Wallach. I, you know, I'm going to the doctor. I'm taking these drugs. You know, it's funny how people think that the drugs are helping them. And so they're, they're healthy. I've heard people say they're healthy and they're on three medications and, um, but we're talking over here and they just don't get it. They have no clue. So the idea is to nudge people along, right? So by moving the box, right? So by moving people along and then they're all of a sudden now, you know, like, oh, this is an incredible idea. But prior to that, they just had no thought around it. And so moving people along and, and, and getting and finding out where they're at, there's nothing wrong with finding out where people are at and, and being okay with that. And that's that, you know, divorcing yourself. Lisa Grossman said on stage one day, she goes, you know, you have to marry the process, right? The system, the process, what we're doing here, but divorce the results because we don't have any control over when it's the right time for someone or when they're going to be ready, or when they've nudged along enough. And that's why what these going to these events and education and all the things that we're doing, even within network marketing, even like doing these books, we're nudging people along. Well, why am I supposed to be doing the 65 in a wake up? Well, you know, <clears throat> where do you want to go? At, you know, from one to 10, and you want to build this business. How important is it for you to want to build to do this business? Well, I'm at a 10. Well, okay. <clears throat> then let's read the book, right? Let's get into 65 and wake up. Then let's do those things. Then let's plug in. But if somebody says, well, I'm like a three, you know, how much are you going to be able to move them into something like this? They're not even ready to make that commitment. So for me, um, 
and, and Denise was just talking about this the other night at our meeting. She was talking about um, motivational interviewing. And so by finding how, how people are going to feel, well, how will you feel when you're healthy and, and be able to do those things and you're not on medications and have to worry about getting your prescriptions? How are you going to feel? I'm going to have, I'm going to feel freedom. You know, I'm going to feel those things around that. So <clears throat> I kind of got off on a tandem, but no, that was great. Yeah. But you know, but, but anyway, so I love, you know, what, uh, this just going through this and everything on the workbook, I, I just love what they're putting together here for us. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and how it's going to help us grow and whether you ever do anything with this book or the workbook or whatever, you've already grown, right. Already grown because now you have the knowledge, mm -hmm. you have more knowledge around this than you had before you started. That's right. And so that whole, um, the idea of everybody you meet, you become a part, you become a part of each other. You know, you, there's like some DNA or some relationship there that, and the uniqueness of the relationships, I love that, um, of who we are and we can be empathetic and machines aren't, but just think about everybody that you've met along the way and how they've contributed in maybe a good way or a bad way. Maybe you look at somebody and go, Hmm, I, you know what? I don't want to be like that person. So I want to make sure I'm going to be this person or wow, I see this person over here and I really want to be more like them. So what are they doing? Right. I'm really passionate about what are they doing? And the reason I'm so passionate about Simon Sinek, besides the fact I kind of have a little crush on him, <laughs> I think he's sexy. And I don't know why, but, um, I do kind of know why, but I just think he's sexy. But just because of his thinking, you know, was reverse of what everybody else is, right? He was doing something different and he wasn't afraid to step out and put himself out there. And another one of his books is um, Why Great Leaders Eat Last. And uh, so last year, my goal, my um, vision board was all about leadership with love and how can I inspire people not by making shaming them or making them feel bad that they, you know, did it's about service. It's service. Right, them. right. It's how can I inspire them within who they are to grow and Go be better in the places that they want to grow and want to be better. And so really that's, he talks about empowering the people that work for you. Right. And one of the stories in his book is talking about this, um, you know, there's, there was a real shift when they went into this, I can lay people off. Oh, and then fix my bottom line. You know, oh, I can just lay off 50 people, you know, and that's going to show that we're making more money because we don't have all this outlow, outflow versus these are humans. This is humanity. What are you doing to these families? And um, so we got this company together, or this company got together. And what they did was they made a rule that they would never fire or lay anybody off. That was their rule. And at first, everybody thought that was terrible. Oh my God, people are going to screw up and, you know, we can't even reprimand them. How are we, you know, we can't fire them. And, um, and, and they would never lay anybody off. Well, what does that look like? And so anyway, what, what they found was what people would like make mistakes and they'd apologize and they would be very creative, right? We'd talk about the creative stuff and people would come in and go, you know what? I think we could do this and this would help this machine and that would be able to make the process faster. And so everything started elevating in this company. And, um, and they said that uh, they would never lay anybody off, but they had furlough days or some, you know, something along those lines. And, um, and people would do donate their furlough days to people who couldn't afford to take the time off. So, hey, kisses and hugs. But, uh, Gavin's going to bed. <laughs> She's oh, good. And hugs. All right. But anyway, I kind of went over, so I apologize. No, you were great. He's saying goodbye. He's waving goodbye. All um, right. Goodbye, goodbye. But you know what? I, I love what you said. And one of the things, going back to the beginning part of what you were talking about, uh, in therapy, we have a thing called entrainment. And what that means is you meet somebody where they are no matter what and no matter how you can elevate them and when you're talking about moving that box and helping to do that where you've got them at a certain level and you can bring them up to a certain point and what we need to be able to understand is that when we have brought them to a certain point that may be as far as they can go and we have to be willing 
to leave them where they are and continue on our journey and do what we're doing, but also be able to come back when they're ready to move forward. And that's where we talk about there's somebody that I met that I knew from a year ago and they weren't ready at the time to get started and wham bang all of a sudden they're ready to come in and and you know be a distributor or buy a CEO pack or do something they're ready to they're ready to take a change you know make a change in their lives because oh my goodness they never realized how bad off their health was and hey are you still doing what you were doing when we talked can you help me now and so it's honoring those people loving them enough to be able to say, it's okay, I respect your decision, and I'm going to be back, and I'll be here for you when you're ready, but I'm going to go do my thing, and then I'll come back and check on you, and they yeah. always say that, and people will always say to me, you know what, Pamela, I love about you is that I never feel like you're pressuring me. You haven't pushed me out of, a, out of what I'm willing to do. Now, have I pushed them to maybe move along their path? Absolutely, but right. they don't feel like they're being made to do something they didn't want to do because I'm, uh, I'm reaching in and getting a hold of them about something that they feel comfortable enough and open enough to be able to make that little bit of a shift with me. And so that's yeah. what I'm talking about is, is helping them, walking arm in arm with somebody, not pushing them, not pulling them, but taking them in the arm and saying, let's go, I'm here with you. And asking permission is huge. Mm -hmm. Can I share something with you? Please. You know, versus, here's what you should be doing. I hear right. people say that and I'm like, oh my goodness, no, no, no. You know, can I share with you something that I heard that might help you in whatever, whatever's going on in your life? Well, anyway, great. Mm -hmm. You did great. I loved it. Um, great, uh, great book, great workbook. And yeah, this has been fun. It is. And, and next Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to start, Marianne and I together, we'll start our training on Longevity University. And so um, that'll be at MarianneNeehouseZoom.com. I'll write that down. Oops. And yeah, it's going to be really interactive. So the goal is to have you guys go through that module and then we'll pretty much talk about, you know, similar to how we're doing this and um, you know, answer questions and help you guys along the process so that you feel comfortable. And here's what I always have to do. If I recommend a video, I have to watch that video before I'm gonna recommend it to you. If I see there's a training, I'm gonna watch that training before I recommend it to you because I wanna know that it goes along the process of which what my truth is, right? What my um, passion, you know, I want to make sure that I'm guiding people. I don't want to get somebody off onto something and then they go, geez, did you watch that? Because I don't even know if that's anywhere close to what we want to be talking about. So right now I'm in the process. Um, I've watched the, um, and the other side, you know, I love the star school stuff. So I'm glad we're not going to be in conflict with them doing the Monday night. And, um, so uh, the, I'm watching the Paul Croto stuff and Pamela and I have actually, we are going to be uh, accountability partners for this um, training. And as I was listening to Paul describe about what's going to be going on, and this is a huge commitment, girlfriend. I don't know if you know that, but it's a big commitment. This is I'm, not. I'm ready, like, but I haven't started, but I'm ready. I know. I know. This is not just like a 30 day thing. This is, he's, I think he said they have like, two or three years of content. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, ready to go. So this will, this is just a continuing thing. And, and I think, you know, what we're talking about is growing. Like, I love that you guys committed to come on and be part of this um, book club because it, you know, what it shows me, what it shows Pamela, what it shows, you know, people around you is that you're committed, right? You're committed to yourself growing. And, um, and so it's, it's not, it, you know, it's just like 65 and wake up. It's not an easy thing to commit to, but sticking with it. And I'm proud of all of you guys, you know, for being a part of this. So anyway, I think um, the stuff that's coming up that I'm seeing that I see, you know, top leaders bringing to the table and some of, I saw so much at the, um, at, you know, at the women's event, right? Just recently. And here's what's so crazy is we have some of the, 
most incredible trainers right here within Longevity, as powerful as anybody I've seen on stage. And so watching, you know, Cheryl Morley and Avelia and, you know, um, Colin Walters and, you know, there were several other people there that I just met and, uh, um, oh shoot, what's his name? What's his name's wife? Rutz. Um, Marlo Rutz, you know, she was amazing. Oh, she's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. She does coaching and comedy and, you know, and she sings, she has a beautiful voice. And, um, and there were some emotional moments, you know, over that training and, and what have you. But I, you know, I just, the betterment video and just what, what we are all embracing here is, is really when I was, when we we're going through the workbook, you know, what are you most passionate about? And I, and I, you know, the whole having coffee with your friends and being able to help them. That's what I want to be able to do, have a solution mm-hmm. for whatever it is that they're dealing with. And sometimes it's just me listening that, you know, and, um, it's things that longevity can't really help, but, but sometimes it's just about me hearing, right. Listening and hearing what they have to say. Two, yeah. two ears, one mouth, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. I love you guys. Love thank you. you. So excited thank about you so Monday. much. Thank you guys so much for coming and, uh, I'm out of here. Yep. Me too. Be blessed. Right. Good night. Love you all. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Love, love you guys. Bye, Ruth Allen. Bye, Lynn. I'll call you tomorrow. Bye, Melissa. Bye. Okay. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. Monday. Yes.